virtuality and these rendered computer spaces um, to create systems that we as musicians can interact with in ways that are familiar and yet unfamiliar, uh, to create sounds and musical structures that are familiar and yet unfamiliar. You sense a pattern here. There's a One thing that I've always been really interested in as a composer and as a person, I guess, are games. Gaming worlds, uh, computer spaces that don't exist yet feel real. And I feel myself immersed in, in them, whether they're two-dimensional, projected on a screen in front of me or behind me, or whether in more contemporary times rendered into goggles or immersive systems of some kind. And playing games is a wonderful experience. They're, they're fast, some, they can be fast and, and allow you to control characters as if they were dancers, as if you were a dancer, even though perhaps you can't dance. Um, there's this fluidity and power in motion that is striking in, and interesting and, and kind of sensual in, in a way. Um, and most of the time it's focused around the art of shooting people. Right, which is, is a thing. Uh, the, it's, as an artist and a musician, this is not generally how I would expect to spend my life, running around the world with laser cannons, blasting people with rockets. It's, it's, it's a, it seems strange when we think about it outside of a virtual space, inside of in, in, uh, a physical space in which we live. And so the use, the way of channeling kind of these these technologies, all these technologies, whether they're gaming technologies or just computer technologies in general, as something else, turning plow sh swords into plowshares, as it were, is we're in a really wonderful time where we can take advantage of that. And so today I'm gonna to take you through a, a series of projects. I'm actually gonna focus on three projects of my own, um, and, but first talk a little bit how we get there, and how we get that to this idea of, of creating instruments for the 21st century, which we are all clearly in at this point. Um, it feels strange, but to look back a decade, 10 years from now, uh, composer, uh, computer scientist Go Wong at Stanford um, released what at the time, due to the launch in 2007 of the iPhone, um, was an absolutely revolutionary way to make music, in, in a sense, and especially at scale. Um, as part of the company Smule, Go released this, this wonderful artifact onto the world. Let's see if we have sound. Where's my sound? I don't have sound. Let me, it's probably my settings. It probably defaulted to the uh, HDMI. There we did. No, it's fine. Here, it was, it was on HDMI. Now it'll work. That's what I get for not testing sound. So this may sound a little bit familiar. So ocarina was a wonderful instrument where a commodity technology device, a telephone, was turned into a fully capable, performable musical instrument. The use of your breath was traditional in a sense, exactly the same way you would control a physical ocarina in the real world. Your fingers on virtual holes changed the frequency of notes that were generated by a simple algorithm, yet a powerful one. The sound was evocative and more importantly, the, the way that you held this device felt natural. It felt like an instrument. It didn't feel like a toy or a piece of technology that allowed us to communicate around the world. This kind of approach of, 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 or of taking commodity systems, whether they're gaming systems or telephones, um, is something that I've been very interested in my whole life. Um, and so stretching back this kind of work, I, I, I've been trying to compose with technology systems that are visual and interactive and game-like 
for a number of years now. Um, here's a few examples. And the, the top was a, a performance uh, piece known, called Nous Sont Tous Fernando um, for laptop orchestra, um, where people were playing in a virtual world. At the bottom is a network performance of Terry Riley's uh, wonderful modernist work, uh, or minimalist work, in C. Uh, performed by virtual performers as well as an ensemble of living performers, physical performers, uh, stretched across networks with uh, a concert pianist sitting on the stage in Milan, Italy, and uh, a violinist and virtual performers on stage at Stanford, and our other, one of another, our other esteemed guests this week, Chris Chafe, although you can barely tell him for the pixels, playing Chiletto from Montana in the United States, all in real time, all across computer networks, um, aided by these kind of bizarre technologies that have been shifted in their use from perhaps the uh, sublime to the ridiculous. It just depends on how you look at things. Um, and perhaps even the most ridiculous of these um, was my fun times taking the Minecraft video game and hacking that with mus into a music engine uh, so that not only could you perform music in Minecraft dynamically, uh, you could also have algorithms coming from musical software generating physical or virtually f physical systems within the game engine. So the relationships of these kind of systems, visual, interactive, musical, sonic, um, is very much kind of the way that, that I spend my time. Um, and, and I think about how instrument design works and, and its combination of engineering and um, art, right? The art and the science. And that's very much the, the world of which I'm, I'm talking about today and, and that um, I'm very much interested in. Um, a lot of this came into really wonderful focus, especially in the use of virtual reality in, in around 2015. Uh, I did a piece with an artist named Chris Platts uh, called Carillon. And Carillon is a virtual bell tower uh, that uh, not only allows you to not only allows you to uh, put on some goggles and and take a place in the virtual space. Uh, it's a concert piece, right? It, it's not an intimate personal experience at your home. It's meant to be shared in front of audiences using a kind of uh, leap motion controllers and and um, in a sense, allowing multiple performers at the same time to control aspects of a giant physical structure, although the physical structure doesn't exist. It's all virtual. Uh, the, the metaphor is similar to playing four hands piano. Uh, two performers, in this case, sharing the same physical instrument, um, grabbing components of it and, and moving them in real time. And those components themselves are controlling and driving sound. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an experience. And so, ironically, at this point, with all the technology that, that we see unveiled in this video, short video clip, um, our, our technology stack, as it were, was barely capable of, re of doing this performance. Right? Our computers were just fast enough to make this happen in 2015. Um, our, uh, the, the other performer in this case nearly passed out on stage due to the low frame rates of his, his head-mounted display. Um, and in this case, we see hands driving gestures, hands reaching out and grabbing these virtual rings, setting them into motion, and their sounds are, are, uh, sounds are generated using their data, um, using different programming languages. At the heart of a, of a model like this was the concept that a carillon is a bell tower. All right? They're meant to, to sound out musical melodies um, and the time and, and all kinds of things, messages being communicated through music and sound. Um, and these messages were being driven by the collision of these objects in game space, just like a rocket might collide with the back of someone's head in, in a, a fun first person shooting game. In this case, these strikers striking bell plates were triggering different notes. Those notes were composed into a game engine using a very strange method, in this case, this kind of a linear graph um, denoting kind of where, where the bell strikes would, would, would find their purchase, so to speak. Um, this whole project was done using the, the Unreal Gaming Engine, 
Um, and in this case, uh, Pure Data, which is an open source programming language uh, for music and audio. Let's see, is this a sound clip one? Core performable no, interface. Sorry, some of these v videos I grabbed actually have me talking in them. You already have one of me talking. Um, so for a project like this, uh, there's this synergy between performer and virtual space. And so it's not enough to look into a virtual space. We, we need to be able to control it with our hands. As any performers of musical instruments out there know, there's a very tactical, tactile and physical experience and, and kind of an embodied experience where, where we use kind of our sense of self to communicate with this physical instrument, whether it's a guitar or a piano or a drum kit. We're used to our bodies doing something, and that helps us. It helps us create and control and understand rhythm. Um, it, it lets us communicate with other performers using subtle gestures of our heads um, and, and, and even less subtle gestures of our hands if we're perhaps conducting or something like that. In this case, for the, the Carillon piece, uh, there's a small piece of technology being used, the Leap Motion Controllers. And some of you are, may be familiar with these. There are these commodity devices you can buy. In the US, they're about $100. Um, and they can mount to the front of any one of these Oculus Rifts or uh, HTC Vives to let your hands, as they were, just enter VR space. And the tracking's done of, of the joints of your hands. And that data now is something that the architect of the game, the designer, or the composer, in my case, can take advantage of. Um, so not only allowing me to use physical gestures of which I can very easily create you know, time relationships between events, just something that we're all used to because we use our hands every day. A project on the scale of, of, of Carillon is, exists purely in virtual space in many ways. Um, it's also uh, physically difficult to set up and carry and move around the world. Um, so if we're talking about instruments and instruments for the, the new ages, 21st century, and, and, and what does it mean to be a virtual instrument? Well, in that case, it was a very clear virtual reality as a buzzword that we hear from technology companies these days. That was very much virtual reality. But if we're talking about just what does it mean to encapsulate the essence of an instrument, like the Ocarina application, which abstracts away the difficulties of, of blowing into a tiny aperture and making sure our, our lips have exactly the right pressure to create a, a wonderful melodic note. Um, the ocarina instrument was able to abstract that difficult part of the instrument away and leave the fun of playing music. You didn't have to worry about making a bad sa sounding uh, note. If any of you are wind players out there, you know your embouchure, how important that is when you're playing whether a clarinet or a saxophone, or in this case, an ocarina. Um, so for, for this next project that I'll talk about briefly, um, I went the other absolutely opposite direction. Rather than having um, complicated large, well at least large scale, physical computing systems necessary to create sound and allow performers to control my, my pieces. Um, an initiative that I've been doing for the last three years at my university in upstate New York is a performance ensemble known as Ensemble Nonlinear. In this case, the, the, the whole goal is to bake down the guts of, of the technology we use into the smallest possible footprint. Um, in this case, the, the, the example being shown here is using Raspberry Pi computers. Right? Very small, very cheap, especially in comparison to the, the technology that we just talked about uh, for, for a piece like Carillon. But again, all connected over a network. So there's this idea of communication, of allowing performers to communicate, um, which is something that comes up in all of these examples, I, I think, um, and, and is very kind of central to this, this idea that even though we're creating disembodied, quote, virtual instruments where the physicality itself perhaps is compromised, is changed compared to the way we play traditional instruments, the, the communication becomes very central to how, how we're going to allow musicians to play together and what we're going to consider musical communication. And here's a little, 
a little fun blast. So in this case, there we have four performers controlling these these in, controlling instruments on these um, tiny Raspberry Pi computers. And you can see the cables. You can see that the, the, the small Raspberry Pis are connected, um, in this case, to one laptop, which is spitting out audio all around the room. Um, the systems are incredibly easy to set up. You plug them in and power them, and all the software is designed to just start. The students don't have to do anything. They come in and start performing. They'll hit one key to shift which instrument they're playing, which is how we play different pieces of music. Um, as part of the class, the students write their own instruments in software. They use different interfaces other than these keyboards as well, but this is kind of fundamentally kind of the, the, the core concept. So anything simple, any way of communicating gesture into the digital realm is kind of the, the way that we control our instruments. So whether it's hands, kind of with fantastical new Silicon Valley devices, or whether it's very cheap computer keyboards and very tiny computers. Um, the instruments in this case that they're playing are very malleable and, and computationally fairly light. Um, and yet we have this same ability, even though when they're not looking at one another in a piece like this, they're still communicating like a traditional musical ensemble. They're listening to one another. They're taking their cues from the direction of the sound that we heard. We saw robots doing just minutes ago in really amazing ways. Um, and so in, in this case, it's, it's kind of a, taking a very different view of what does it mean to build an instrument for the 21st century. Um, by no means do I advocate that this, this, these kind of approaches are the musics of the future or the instruments of the future. These are, but we're on a, a path, all of us are, with our, how comfortable we've become with technology so that these kind of approaches are more and more natural. And with every new generation, many of you out there included, who arrive on this planet, this only becomes more and more natural. It's not a question of what, whether this will happen, it's a question of how soon. How soon these approaches feel more and more natural to the point that they're not even worthy discussing. Right? I'm excited over that. So, so, so with the ensemble nonlinear and these Raspberry Pi instruments, this is now a very small physical footprint and it's not relying on visual elements like we saw in the Carillon project. Um, and yet the communication between performers are still there. Um, and, and so fundamental to, to, to everything that I've been working on, it, just in retrospect, looking at kind of a, a series of my own works to prepare a talk like this, um, it's that central communication that, that I find most fascinating. That's where the real fun stuff starts to happen. So whether we're communicating across networks from Stanford to Milan, thanks to Chris, who's now here, you missed, I zoomed in on your pixels from Milan. You know, you weren't here. Um, whether it's, but w you were there, but he was here with us, right? So whether it's, it's kind of communicating across massive distances or whether it's communicating at a small table like this with gesture and data, just like we communicate with visual elements. Um, that's kind of central to all these things. So, so the, the, the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus on the piece that I'm performing here at, uh, on Friday of next week. Um, and it's actually a new virtual instrument that I've built and, and, and a piece that goes along with it. In this case, the instrument is called quartet, pun intended. Um, the quartet itself is a flexible virtual digital instrument. So returning to the scale of something like the Carillon project, um, quartet is a virtual embodiment of what a string instrument might become, not will become, not everything is going to be like this. In my mind, I had the very, a very central question, what if, what if we spent our time right now and tried to build what could come next, assuming no one else will ever pick up this thread and continue? Um, and it all came out of a question that would always be asked to me whenever I would talk about the Carillon project, which was, you know, I, I, I play it a lot by myself. I'll go to a concert and I'll perform that piece by myself. And I end up telling people a lot of the time, 
this piece is designed to run across networks with lots of people. Um, and the only reason I can't do it is because we don't have the hardware. And I said that over and over and over so many times. It's like we write, wrote a system that was designed to work with many people and I'm only playing it by myself because I don't have enough computers and don't have enough. So with this project, I said no more. We're never gonna do that again. Well, maybe at least not right now. So Quartet is designed for, for performers. And to facilitate it, um, it was necessary to go out and buy a whole bunch of computers and a whole bunch of head-mounted displays and suffer the slings and arrows of carrying those things across the world in bags and briefcases. Um, and so that's kind of the world in which we're entering now is in 2018, it's still required to carry around a massive amount of technology to facilitate these kind of interactions. And so by this model, quartet is designed to be a virtual string quartet. Um, performers play these virtual instruments just as they would play traditional stringed instruments, though everything's fundamentally a little bit different. Um, in this case, uh, the, the right hand of the performer, and you'll see in this clip here, um, has a bow. It's holding a bow, just like a traditional stringed instrument. And when that bow collides with part of the instrument, it drives the sound. And the left hand, well, in this case, we're using Oculus Rifts, and Oculus Rift touch controllers have these little joystick kind of devices. And so there's no tactile response. There's no finger on string, which is a fundamental part of any string performance practice. Um, so again, kind of going back to the, the model that of Go Wong's ocarina, how do you abstract the issue? How do you abstract the idea of playing the violin? How do you make a model of it where all the most am amazing salient, salient points of that interaction are there that make me feel like I'm creating music on a violin when, of course, I know I'm not. And it is a fundamentally different experience, but the idea is how do I get as close as possible using this kind of technology where there isn't really a way to compromise around the fact that I'm not holding anything, right? So here's, so in this case, each button on the left hand essentially triggers when a finger would be pre pressed on a string and the location of those, of these nodes that appear are just as if that's where my finger was on the string. And it's following the motion of my hand in real time just like anything would. Like this. <laughs> and by, by contrast, on the right hand, again, there's no physical contact. There's nothing for my right hand to lay that bow across so that I have a physical connection with the instrument. That's a huge disconnect to work around if you're trying to build something that feels like a violin or a cello. And so in this case, um, I build a virtual bar and depending on where you contact with it, it controls how much pressure is activated in the sound, just like a, a performer was pressing harder on the bow, which has a very noticeable effect on the sound. Um, the velocity of your stroke as you're bowing is remarkably similar to the real world. That's something that comes across in the experience. Um, and by carefully tracking where on the bow from the tip to, to where your hand is on the frog um, connects with this, this bowing bar, you have a very nice way of controlling where kind of subtle changes in sound, just like violinists or cellists or violists would do. So here's just a kind of from the other camera view, this is playing a playing the, the, the violin model of it, and this is perhaps the viola. So luckily, the technologies that we're using these days are extremely responsive. There's no latency in the system like this. 
Um, it's, it's the data that from the collision between these two virtual objects is sent nearly instantaneously to the software generating sound. If there were, was a significant amount of latency there, if it took too much time for the signal to make any sound, we as musicians would, are hyper sensitive to that and, and we would notice that instantly. In this case, it, it's, it's, it works wonderfully, which is great. I can't take too much credit for it. <laughs> um, so part of the model here is that performers are performing in a virtual space. And at this point, we're getting two views of this. One from the client, from what I'm seeing in my goggles on the, on the left, and the other from the server, right? If you're playing a video game and you're on a server with multiple people, you're all existing somewhere in network space. So in this case, the server allows multiple performers to get together and perform. So in, here we see the server on the right, I'm the only one in it, but it's a very different view, right? It's a view that in this case would be projected to an audience, but also the view from the performer in VR space sitting across from me. That's what they would see. At this, case, at this point, a disembodied head and, and, and a bow, because in a sense, the gestures of the head and the hands for the performers are fundamental um, to being able to communicate small bits of information to one another. Now the instrument isn't traditional, so we can do all kinds of fun things. Um, the strings don't have to react the same way. We can go into different states. I can set it right now, these are just some examples, um, to split down the center. So it's any, any finger position above that line would be one note, any finger position below it would be another, splitting it at the octave. Um, similarly, you can split it to be a major triad or have a certain kind of a scale, like a pentatonic scale, a whole tone scale, or 12 note diatonic scale. Not the traditional kind of logarithmic mapping that we see in, in a physical string, but we can change that for better or for worse, I guess, right? There we go, it's more natural. <laughs> um, I, ha I, couldn't, I couldn't resist sharing this photo. Um, one of the trials and tribulations of working in this kind of world right now in 2018 is it's very difficult to code and work in virtual reality on a network project by yourself. I'll just say that. Um, and in this case, to use these kind of commodity devices, the Oculus Rift headset um, and, and the code base that we're using, you can start to see there's a, a number of machines scattered behind it, one for each of the clients. In this case, uh, this, I thought this was great. Uh, this is my, my, my Team Mexico soccer ball. Um, but the, uh, in order to make the system see that there was a head on one of these devices, I had to make it think there was a head stuck in it. So I have a series of soccer balls scattered around my lab, which I would cram into the headsets so that I could launch all these devices to test them at the same time. In this case, this, is, this was my Mexico ball. So this is my, my, my favorite one in my lab right now. Okay. So I thought I'd show that. So all of this kind of came to a head uh, just a few months ago. Uh, the, uh, the piece that I'm going to perform on Friday, um, we did a version of it in Austria at the IEM, the Institute for Electronic Music, um, Acoustics, Music and Acoustics. And uh, so here's just a, a short clip of that so you get an idea of what I'm talking about. Four virtual performers in, in an inverted position. They're not physically facing one another, but in virtual space they are, seeing just like they would play a court, string quartet. Oh, I hit the button twice. We always do that, don't we? Um, and so above, in, here we see this is a, this is a camera view, um, a different camera view from that server that is shown to the audience. So they get to see the virtual experience at least from an outsider's standpoint. Because right now it's hard to get an audience into virtual reality along with the performers. I can't get you all headsets, right? You know, it, or computers and headsets. It's, it's a, a challenge that will go away as technology evolves, but at the state we are in in 2018, it's a fundamental concern in a sense. So here, this is, this is what I do, and this is how we'll be performing the piece on Friday. Um, performers from a traditional string quartet who have years and years and years of training. Oh, did I set this to, I think I made it automatically go, stop playing, apologies. 
No. I won't mess with it. I'll just play it here. Um, so they're leveraging their ability to, to bow and communicate and understand the, the physicality of their instrument that they've spent so long playing on. And so in my case, I was very interested in trying to build an experience that performers would love. It would be fun, it would be challenging. It obviously would be different, but it would feel familiar. Um, so my approach currently to designing instruments for the next millennia, as it were, um, is to follow that idea. How do we make the performers engage these systems in a way that is challenging and different yet familiar? And so this idea of abstracting away certain qualities of the instrument to fit one medium is something that I'm very interested in in this approach. And so I'll just let it play for a little bit and get a little taste. I was waiting for the camera to change view just so you had, I'll have to force it to, there you go. So in this case, um, the performance shown to the audience can take advantage of virtual cinematographies to give different views into the space, kind of a real time panning of cameras and just a fun thing that we like to do to explore this in, in a way that the, the audience can actually see more of what's happening. So I'm not gonna give away too much, you all have to come to the concert next week. So that's it for me. I just wanted to share some of the work that I've been doing around this question. What does it mean to build a virtual musical instrument? What does it mean to um, take a, a performance practice that's traditional and yet push it into the future in one way, not in every way? There will be many, many different and many, many better uh, virtual musical instruments to come over the next 100 years. Um, this is just one step one contribution, I think, towards that future, and uh, it's also a lot of fun. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, no, it's a great question. The question is, is you know, the, the idea of introducing error into the, the system, which is something naturally we all have to overcome playing any instrument. Um, in this case, thankfully, built in, as Chris is laughing because he's played it, um, there's plenty of error built in. Um, in this case, both with the way that you contact a bow when there's no physical resistance, it's something we take for granted as musicians, in this case, I could bow a string and take my eyes off it instantly because physically I know I'm still connected. 
In virtual space, you have no such mechanism. It's very easy to move your hand off. Right? And while I've built in me mechanisms you can use to mitigate that, if you play the instrument just as it is, you have to, it, there's a lot of error in, in how you could bow it. Similarly, on the pitch side, when there's no physical place for me to anchor my hand, and even if I know the kind of hand positions that a violinist or a cellist or a violist would use, I don't have that ability anymore. So I'm forced to use my ear and my eye to determine where I am at any given moment on the neck in order to play a specific pitch. Lots of error, lots of error. So while I, I did talk a little bit about these, these kind of error correcting mechanisms, whether it's setting the scale in a certain way and locking the notes in, or but when you play it in its natural mode, the, the frequency range is extremely challenging of the instrument. So in this case, there is lots of error built in, but that is a really great point is if the instruments are too easy, just like many things in life, why would we bother, right? So in this case, this is not an instrument designed for every person. This is an instrument designed for musicians. Um, not to put words in his mouth, but the ocarina example I showed early on, Ge always talks about, you know, that was the idea is how do you get this so everyone can make music with it, right? There was, the idea was to abstract away all the difficulties of it. You still have to control timing, right? You still have to come up with rhythm and play the right pitches, but a lot of the difficulty was taken away. This one, it's still quite difficult, but it's, it's a great question. Yeah, so, so in this case, the, right now, for me and for many of us, virtual reality is already fundamentally challenging, right? Spending time in these spaces and interacting with it, we're all still learning as humans how, this, how to make this not annoying and not debilitating even for some people. Um, so the idea of splitting out two views in, in a headset like this, it would fundamentally, it would break, it would break the, the, the ability to, to understand depth it would just become two flat television displays in a sense. Um, so I haven't considered that one. Um, but in answer to the first part of your question, which was kind of talking about changing the instruments so these things can be seen, they can be seen, right? The idea is that this is three-dimensional space. So if I hold the cello in a traditional manner, I can look down the neck and see that I'm bowing, right? Um, it's just if you're like me, and, and fundamentally, since if my hand is up here behind my head, because I've made the instrument very large, which I like to do. Um, and I can no longer see that it's not in my field of vision, as if I were playing a giant physical instrument. Now, in a physical instrument, I would feel where I was. Here I can't, so I have to hear where I am on the neck. So it's a, it's a, I'm relying on a different sense more than I would maybe have to, um, or at least in a different way. Right? And though an acoustic instrument, I would still rely on my ear. Um, by that same token, if I'm playing the violin model and it's floating on my shoulder, I actually can see what I'm playing. Is it difficult? Yes, it's difficult. But it, so in a sense, I'm trying to keep it as true to form as possible to allow traditional performers to have a leg up, to have a, uh, an advantage over everyone else. But those are good suggestions. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Do, 
does who need to see, the performer or the audience? Um, the audience. Like, the audience. Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, have you considered making a virtual environment like this? Sure. So, yeah, yeah. So, if the question is, have you considered making a virtual environment like this where you can play together without it being visual? I mean, these in this instrument wouldn't work if it wasn't visual. But the, the, because you actually have to see what you're playing. But instruments like the ones I showed right before that, and the ensemble nonlinear Raspberry Pi instruments, there's no visual interface. The, this, in this case, the performers don't even have a screen. They literally have nothing to look at. They're holding something that lets them interface with the computer. But there's no display. There's not even a regular computer display. So in that case, it's very much like what you're talking about. They're communicating. In this case, the, the networking, the devices are connected. So they can send messages to one another, and whether they're sonic or they're telling the system to do something, there's a communication level there. In the examples I showed, they're really communicating using their ears. So whether they were in different rooms or, in that case, in the same room, they're doing a lot of what you're talking about. So it's very much something like that. You know. So you're saying if you're if you're a musician, why even bother? Mm. So what kind of things could you do that would take it to the next level or? Yeah, no, that, so, so things are very different um, when we strap boxes to our faces. Um, certain things that musicians take for granted are no longer possible, like reading sheet music, right? So in this case, for this piece, there's a movement where they play a very traditionally notated piece of music. In order to show that to them, I had to make some decisions. And so since they can't just look at music, which are, they could actually play it on this if they could see something, um, I build a system where the notes appear on the neck. Dots appear on the neck to tell them what the next note is. Um, it necessitates a different style of composition. It changes the way I work as a musician, how, what kinds of um, rhythmic structures or, or harmonic or, or melodic things, ideas I might want to try to put in this piece, um, which is great, but it's a very different experience. But it allows them to know that they're all synchronized on the same part of the piece of music. They can literally just see it on the necks of their instruments. So they say, oh, these are my options right now. Everyone else will be playing a note that works with these. So that's an example of trying to use this visual medium in a different way to allow these kinds of performers to do something different. Um, by contrast, I could just print a giant sheet of music in there, but it's actually, I think this approach might prove a little bit more resilient. I'm not sure. That's a great question. Thank you. Anyone else? Going once, twice. Great. Thank you all very much.